Hello colleagues, I am Dr. Rajesh Ravindranathan, popularly known as Dr. Raj. I am here to speak to you about neuromuscular dentistry, NMD, uh, to help us as dentists treat patients suffering from temporomandibular joint disorders, sleep apnea, cervical issues and etc. As part of this, I have undergone my training under Dr. Fabio Savastano and Dr. Piero Silvestrini in Italy. I went on to do my sleep residency at Tufts, Boston under Dr. Noshir Mehta. Currently, I have just completed my fellowship and mastership from ICMO. ICMO is ICCMO. It is an international college for craniomandibular orthopedics. It is the organization for us neuromuscular dentists. So, we at ICMO conduct courses, conferences all over the world to spread the word of neuromuscular dentistry and how we can help our patients. As part of this, to help the growth of neuromuscular dentistry in India, I have started a company called Indra Craniofacial Pain Relief. And under this company, we have a brand name known as the Right Bite. So the Right Bite basically runs clinics all over India. Uh, we have tied up with important hospitals, famous hospitals and clinics in Cochin, Bangalore, Mumbai, Delhi and Calcutta. We have done training for the dentists there. They help the patients. I go there once in a while. What we are trying to do is to get more dentists into the fold because there are that many patients suffering. It is just not possible for just 5 or 10 people to work so much. Okay, I have done my uh, BDS from Chennai under the MGR Medical University. I got my mastership from the craniomandibular mandibular from ICMO. My diploma in neuromuscular orthodontics from ICNOG. I did my dental sleep medicine at, at the Tufts University and the other achievements that I have had. But so, ICMO is what we are trying to stress. At the last meeting in San Diego or uh, in 2016, ICMO India section got the approval. We are going to be officially ratified at Bu uh, Buenos Aires next year. Uh, that is in April 2017. But since we've got approval, we've started our courses. And uh, our first course would be beginning in Jan in Delhi. So our courses have been Right Bite. Courses have been named as the Right Bite Learn Neuromuscular Dentistry courses. They are courses 1 to 8. Course 1 is the current one that you are having a look at. It's a webinar. It's a 45 minute webinar. Course 2 is hands on workshop uh, how to take a tense bite and use a T-scan to check for uh, the micro occlusion because that's your first step into neuromuscular dentistry. Course 2 is what I just said and course 3 is the next step which is once you get a hold of the tense bite and the basics of neuromuscular dentistry. You learn the K7, you learn the biopack. That's the ultimate. Because the K7 bite or the biopack bite is much more precise than the tense bite, which I'll be explaining in time to come. Course 4 would be the prosthodontic second phase. Course 5 would be the orthodontic second phase. Course 6 would be on sleep apnea. Course 7 would be on cervical posturology and course 8 would be with Dr. Dave Singh himself. We will be conducting DNA courses, the DNA appliance courses, uh, which actually has been scheduled for November next year. So, the steps towards being the ultimate neuromuscular dentist would be do the course 1, do the course 2, course 3, Show your cases at ICMO, be a fellow, then present your mastership thesis. And if approved, you get your mastership from ICMO India itself. Isn't that great? My mastership thesis was 
on the effect of lathyrogens on collagen formation leading to the prevalence of TMJ disorders. You might be thinking, why do we have to think about all that? But believe it or not, we dentists have a lot more to do than just the mechanical work on your teeth. The principles and fundamentals of neuromuscular dentistry is the course one. Now, what are these terms? NMD, TMD, OSA, etc. NMD is neuromuscular dentistry, TMD is temporomandibular joint disorders, and OSA is obstructive sleep apnea. Dr. Bernard Jankelson is known as the father of neuromuscular dentistry. His motto has always been if it has been measured, it's a fact. Otherwise, it's just a hypothesis, okay? It's always just an idea. So, neuromuscular dentistry is proven. This is what we are trying to say, which is why we know what exactly is happening to the face, to the neck, basically the whole head and neck area. So, the primary aim of NMD is to keep the stomatognathic triad happy. Now, what is the stomatognathic triad? The triad, three. You've got the teeth, you've got the joints, and you've got the muscles. You need all three to be happy. Keeping them happy is the aim of neuromuscular dentistry. So no matter how malpositioned the teeth are, the muscles will struggle somehow or the other to bring the jaw into an occlusion, the habitual occlusion. It might be correct for some, might be wrong for some. If it goes wrong, you end up with struggling muscles that lead to headaches, migraines, neck aches, shoulder aches. So, neuromuscular therapy involves the reduction of noxious stimuli caused by the faulty occlusion that causes the facial and masticatory muscles to become hypertonic and thereby relaxing those struggling hypertonic muscles is the most important part of neuromuscular dentistry. Is NMD occlusion? Is neuromuscular dentistry equal to physiological occlusion? Occlusion is maintained by the activities of the masticatory muscles, which are controlled by the neural integration of the feedback from peripheral proprioceptors and the reflex mechanism from the CNS. The masticatory muscles which position and connect the mandible to the skull should be the focal point of correct occlusion. Is centric occlusion the same as habitual occlusion? Is that the same as the physiological or neuromuscular or myocentric occlusion? No. What about centric relation? Centric relation is a term that has been changing definitions for quite some time. Isn't this what we do now? It's funny. But whenever a patient comes to your clinic, you ask, you need to take the bite. How do you register the bite? Okay, go as back as you much, really back, keep going and you just push it out, you know. Just think what you're doing to the joints, the condyle. There's so much pressure that is being exerted within the joint space. Centric relation is defined as the most retruded relation of the mandibles to the maxilla when the condyles are in the most posterior, unrestrained position in the glenoid fossa from which free lateral movement can be made. Now, the most retruded relation, that's a problem. Even Dawson himself has gone to correct that. This term is now in transition to obsolence. And that has even been mentioned by the prosthetics. So, neuromuscular dentistry is the way to go forward. So, what is the TMJ? So, the TMJ is the only joint in our body that has rotational and translational movement. Rotational and translational movement which is why it is virtually impossible to replicate it. What are controlling these movements? The muscles, the anatomy. So you have the disc, you have the muscle, you have the mandible, you have the temporal part of the maxillary bone. So the disc always lies in between the mandible, the condyle and the maxilla. The disc is actually an extension of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. So, what is actually happening? Why is the disc going out of place? Basically, any change in shape and position of the lateral pterygoid muscle ends up with a disc prolapse. 
I'd like to show you through a video how the TMJ actually works. It's courtesy of a university in Sweden. It's a pretty old video. It's all over the YouTube. So what happens is, as you can see, the disc that lies between the condyle and the temporal bone, as the jaw opens, you can see the disc always lying in between the two bones with every opening and closing. And this is how a healthy TMJ functions. So what actually controls the movement of the lower jaw? The muscles. What are those muscles? You have the masseter, the temporalis, the medial pterygoid, the lateral pterygoid, the digastrix, the supra and the infrahyoid muscles. All these muscles need to be in balance for the proper movement of the lower jaw. So what are temporomandibular joint disorders? It's a derangement within the complex, the temporomandibular joint complex. So this complex TMJ can be altered by just a slight change in the position of the lower jaw by even as simple as an occlusal high point which is why neuromuscular dentistry is so successful because 90 percent of all TMJ are myogenous which means muscles in origin. I want to show you an example with the most common symptom of TMJ which is a click. Now why does a click happen? A click happens because now for example you have an occlusal prematurity. That prematurity sends a signal to the brain, which is a noxious, a noxious proprioceptive signal. So that signal basically tells the lower jaw to avoid that high point, forms an avoidance conditioning response. That response gets into your brain as a sensory engram. That engram causes the muscle hyperactivity. Any muscle hyperactivity causes excitation of the reticular activation system, which is the pain cycle. So you start the pain spasm cycle, which leads again to the muscle hypertonicity. So it's like a circle. The muscle hypertonicity continues as a compensatory movement of teeth into the new position, which then causes stress trigger points. Now this continuous hyperactivity, any muscle, once they get hyperactive for a long period of time, they shorten. So when you go to a gym, when you try lifting weights, the first thing that happens is when you build your muscles, they're actually shortening. They're becoming more bulky, they shorten. Similarly, when the lateral pterygoid shortens, it pulls the disc in front and you hear the click. So once we eliminate the trigger points, once we eliminate the shortening, we get rid of TMD. So there are two types of TMD. There is internal disc derangement, IDD, without reduction and there is IDD with reduction. So with reduction is wherein you hear the click. Now what does that mean? When the muscle shortens, the disc is pulled forward to an extent where it can be recaptured. So that is IDD with reduction. And if the problem persists, it goes into IDD without reduction. Now what does that mean? The muscle is permanently pulled forward. The most common symptom when a patient comes to you with IDD without reduction would be the patient finding it very difficult to open the mouth or lack of, you know, mouth opening. I'd like to show you a video again, thanks to the university in Sweden. We have a video where you can very clearly see what happens to the muscle and the disc. As the mouth opens, the condyle moves forward and when it's trying to come back, you can see how it's getting pushed up and forward. So that sudden movement of this of the disc is what's causing the problem you can see how it clicks open now it's fully open and it's being pulled forward because the muscle has shortened the lateral pterygoid muscle that's lying in front has shortened the next stage which is the idd without reduction so what happens is the muscle is that shortened it's so shortened that the disc is permanently placed forward you can see how the disc is permanently placed forward and there is no recapture at all. You can see how the posterior sheath is that thinned out. It just stays in front. There is no recapture at all. So how do we diagnose a TMJ disorder? We normally use imaging, 
palpation techniques, the TENS device, EMGs and mandibular tracing devices. The TMJ palpation is we could do it preauricular and intraauricular. So, we when you do it intraauricular, you ask the patient as well as preauricular, you ask the patient to open and close. We can feel whether there is a smooth movement of the joint, whether there is a click or not, whether the patient is in pain. Most of the times, more often than not, you have the condyle coming back when you place your fingers intraauricular and you get to know that there is some sort of a muscle trouble there because the patient is in pain. You can feel the condyle pressing on your lower fingers. Imaging modalities. So, we have the transcranial projection, we have the transpharyngeal projection, the lateral shaft, the OPG. However, the TMJ view left and right open and close is the most important because we can very clearly see when the patient is in a closed position and the when patient is in a op open position. So, in the closed position we can see if there is space between basically the joint space whether it is present or not and in the open position we can know whether there is ample forward movement or not. Although there are there is the arthrography and which is still practiced by many, I would always prefer the 3D CT uh, because the CBCT shows us the exact position of the condyle within the joint space. Signs and symptoms. The extra oral signs. A patient would normally come to a dentist with the lack of opening. But when you look at these symptoms, headaches, why would a patient with a headache come to you, right? He goes to an ENT when actually the problem is TMJ. Do you know that 60% of all headaches and migraines are actually caused due to a TMJ? It's a muscle problem. It's our problem. We as dentists need to be treating them. So, headaches and migraine, clenching, bruxism, neck aches, shoulder aches, facial asymmetry, short face syndrome. Yes, because the lower jaw is pushed there. Deep mentalis crease, again, because of the short face. The forward head posture caused due to or an imbalance in your body posture because of sleep apnea problems, vertigo, tinnitus, ear congestion, postural discrepancies, intraoral signs. A class 2 div 2 is the most common intraoral sign that you would see with a TMJ patient. Whenever I see uh, a class 2 div 2 in my office, the first thing I ask is, do you have headaches? 90% of them say yes and they are on drugs for years together. And then we need to educate the patient. See, this is the problem. It's tough. They wouldn't believe you in the beginning. But then you need to know that you're the one to treat them. So, of course, crowding, excessive wear because of the night grinding, lingual inclination of the lower teeth because of the class 2 div 2, the bicuspid drop off again, uh, the depressed curve P, narrow arches, lack of tongue space, sleep apnea issues, high palatal vault, midline discrepancy, single side chewing, erratic chewing habits lead to facial asymmetry, tongue thrust. So, the most common cases are that are those that involve deep bites. Class 2 div 2 has always been the villain due to their tendency to relapse. Now, why do they relapse? It's because when we treat them orthodontically, we do not make sure that the muscles are fine, which is where neuromuscular orthodontics comes to the fore. But once they are neuromuscularly treated, the myocentric occlusion is retained till the other external forces act upon the joint, you don't need a retention device. All of these symptoms are of trigeminal nerve origin. Wow, look at that. Migraine, the meningeal nerve because it's the meninges that control that. Ear pain, the cauda tympani, OSA, the lingual and the transapalatine, the plus the glossopharyngeal. So, all these are of trigeminal nerve origin. We have had dentists go and say that the trigeminal nerve is the dentist nerve, the masticatory muscle innovation, the, which controls the mandibular position, which controls the occlusion and hence the condylar position within the articular fossa. See from where TMD comes. Now, the TMD symptoms could be ascending or it could be descending, wherein TMD can be caused due to things as far as a short foot and vice versa. You could have patients suffering from TMD also having problem like a leg pain, you know. So, the TMJ has the ability to accommodate both occlusal and cervical dysfunctions. Hence, 
the prevalence of TMD. Treatment modalities. Surgery has been the most commonly done treatment for TMJ problems till now, I would really say. Because even now, when a patient comes to you with TMD, you'd normally send them to a surgeon, right? Now, what are the surgical procedures? It's a condylectomy, it's a condylotomy, eminectomy, disc plication, pterygoid fracturing, myotomies, shaving. However, there are a lot of complications of surgery as well, like the paralysis, scarring, bleeding, foreign body rejection and etc. TMJ arthroscopy is another method of uh, treat, treating TMJ disorders. It's an arthrocentesis procedure, lysis and lavage is done, the disc reduction is taken care of. However, it could end up with disc sclerosis. So, these are the complications, perforations of the membrane, roof of glenoid fossa, the nerve injury, bleeding. Another method of treatment is injection therapy, intraarticular corticosteroids sclerosins. So, there are lots of other docs who have been trying to replicate the TMJ by cutting the condyle off, the whole TMJ joint process off and getting an implant done, but they have not been as successful. So, we need to catch the bull by its horns. Oh, uh, that was me uh, at Wall Street. So, the first thing when a patient comes to me, what we do is, we normally ask them to fill up a very detailed questionnaire. It asks questions as simple as headaches, migraines, uh, about your ENT conditions, your jaw joint problems, even your stop bank questionnaire which takes care of your sleep apnea. So, is neuromuscular dentistry the way to move forward? It is literally the mandible wants to move forward. We need to let it come forward. So, like I said before, any of the TMD symptoms can be caused by having the resting position or bites being off by less than a millimeter or due to interferences of a fraction of a millimeter in the path of closure. This leads us to the search of the elusive myocentric occlusion. And what is the myocentric occlusion? How do we achieve it? So, this is the neuromuscular protocol. This is what we follow to make sure patients are doing much better. Tense therapy, followed by the mandibular kinesiography, followed by an orthotic placement, which undergoes a digital micro occlusal scan. So, the objectives of neuromuscular therapy is one, to restore normal blood flow to the muscles, thereby increasing oxygen and ATP, to eliminate sources of nerve and vascular entrapments to eliminate myofascial triggers and to restore postural integrity. So, this is part of the NMD protocol. We have the K7 apparatus, we have the bio pack, we have a TENS device, we have bio TENS machines, we have a T scan and that is how the whole system works. So, what is the protocol? The neuromuscular way. How is neuromuscular dentistry performed? First, we relax the muscles with a low frequency TENS device and check them by means of EMG. And then we apply functional analysis with a mandibular tracking device. What do we get? We obtain a recorded personal mandibular tracking in habitual and after muscle relaxation. We register this relationship with a specific resin. This recording is known as the myocentric. Now we know what the muscles and joints are asking for. So, we follow a two phase therapy. The first phase involves the muscle reprogramming with a neuromuscular splint and the second phase involves maintenance of that position with a permanent occlusion either by orthodontics or prosthetics. Reprogramming muscle balance with a tense device, aquilizer and a new calm. So, we have the J5 myo monitor, we have the BNS40 and we even use a bio tense. So, what these tense appliances do is they are battery operated, they provide ultra low frequency of 2 to 3 hertz, they provide bilateral simultaneous stimuli of the facial and the masticatory muscles, the electrodes are placed over the coronoid notch and there is a pulse every one and a half second. This is how the electrodes are placed, they are placed in front of the coronoid notch. Why? So, the mandibular notch provides an open pathway through the highly conductive tissue to the motor trunk of the 7th nerve and to the more medial fifth nerve. 
as it emerges through the foramen ovale. So, the bilateral electrodes are placed over this notch anterior to the external auditory meatus and the inactive ground is placed on the nape of the neck. TMD is so painful that the patient may be sleep deprived for months together. In most of these cases, a uh, simple relaxation of the muscles would give the patient so much relief that they automatically go, go to sleep. I have had cases where an equalizer was not enough, a tense was not enough. I even had to provide a new calm. A new calm is where you give a patient, uh, it is a device which helps the patient to sleep, achieve REM sleep in a witchy. And this is the new calm device. So, once the tense is applied, we ensure that the muscles are relaxed with the help of EMGs. So, this is how the patients would have come to you in the beginning. Look at how the temporalis and the masseters and even the sternocleidomastoids are hy hyperactive. 45 minutes tense application and they are all normal. Once we confirm that the patients are fine with their muscles, we use the K7 kinesiography or the biopack. So, we place a piece of magnet on the lower teeth. We use the K7 device which basically runs on electromagnetism. We record the bite known as the myocentric. So, what happens is, this is the basic scan, this is the centric occlusion. We ask the patient to open, close, open, close, relax and that is the pulsing with the tense device and we draw an imaginary line from that tensing to the protrusive border of the upper anterior. 1.5 millimeter is normally what we place the myocentric as because that is the minimum required freeway space. Gelb done wonderful studies which show that the condyle is always in the happiest place when it is in the 4 or 7 position based on this diagram. All our neuromuscular, neuromuscularly treated patients end up in the 4 or 7 position which is why NMD is perfect. So, once this is done, we record the bite and we give the patient an orthotic or a mora. Orthotics are now available as acrylic or with resin. The resin lasts a little longer, but you have got to change them anyway. You wear it for 6 to 8 months, you check with EMG for muscle tonicity once in 2 3 months. They may need one or two more orthotics depending on the severity of the case. Now, phase 2. Once the patient is fine, we check the EMG, we, we uh, do the questionnaire again, we check the pain scale. If they are fine with that, we go to the next phase because we need to maintain that position. Phase 2 is maintenance of phase 1 and occlusion. So, we stabilize the jaw, jaw position and muscle isotonicity with dental occlusion. Prosthodontic zirconia ceramic composite crown buildups, orthodontic supra eruption, expansion and now extraction retraction, lifetime orthotic wear. So, these are the options that the patient has. Patient can do a prosthodontic crown buildup. You can see how the crowns are built up or you could do a neuromuscular orthodontic positioning wherein the, mus the lower teeth posteriors are brought up with elastics. Patient is happy, no more headaches, no more neck aches, no more back aches, better posture, magic, not at all. Then what? It is just pure common sense. It is all logic. Why do we need to work with assumptions in the mind? Oh, this might be the bite. Let us just feel and see. No. Use the equipments. See if the muscles are fine and record the bite. See, why and how are you sure? Because it is all measured. Posturology. Other than cranial sutures, the occlusion of teeth is the most superior anatomic articulation and it also has the most profound influence on other body functions and relationships. So, erect posture, the tooth with the opposing tooth is the first skeletal joint. Teeth are the terminal end point of the postural chain. We follow it up with the glenoid fossa, the occiput, the shoulder joint, the cervical spine, the hip, the knee and the ankle. So, any change in, po in position of your lower jaw would cause a change in position of your cervical vertebrae. So, the head moves forward shifting the you know the center of gravity. So, to compensate for that the body changes shape. You can see how a short foot can cause all these issues and hence its utilization in sports medicine. So, in short 
the normal occlusal flags are the following. If you take care of all these flags, voila, no more headaches, no more TMD, no more pain. So, we have heard the theory. Now, let us see on a couple of cases what we can do, what we have done. So, this is a neuromuscularly treated prosthodontic patient. This is how she ended up as, but let us see. So, I am sorry, this is how she turned up as, okay. So, you can see how the deep bite is, she has been given a couple of bridges here and there. Uh, she came to me with uh, a lot of headaches, a um, lot of, uh, she cannot chew, she has got pain while eating and sleep apnea symptoms. Uh, she hears a clicking and a popping noise, uh, difficulty in opening the mouth, uh, clenching during the daytime and the usual symptoms. And this was what we got when we checked her EMG before tense. You can see how the right masseter is really hyperactive. She had an okay freeway space, 2.3 millimeter is not bad. And the scan too showed how her mouth, you can see from this, how her mouth was opening towards the left by at least 7 millimeters. Her mouth opening was a little reduced with only 23 millimeters. So, our job was to get them changed as well. So, we apply the tents and what do we get? The right masseter is still hyper. The other three have slowed down, but the right masseter is still hyper. We, however, go forward with the bite registration. We registered a myocentric and you can see how a mouth opening has improved by 2 millimeters. So, we articulate that, the orthotic. We build the orthotic and we insert it into the patient's mouth. So, the patient wears it for uh, I think 8 months. You can see how her pain has all subsided. So, this is done on 15, 6, 13. She came back after 10 months on 12, 8, 2015 and see what has happened in, 12, in 10 months. Her mouth opening has increased to 33 millimeters. Her mouth opening is now straight. So, we did the K7 after 10 months when she came back. She was totally pain free and happy. Look at her uh, previous phase. Good. So, what is the next step? To do second phase. So, we use that same orthotic space. We record the bite and we give her crowns on the posterior side with her occlusion checked with a T-scan. Now, it is not just the headaches that we have gotten rid of. Look at how her posture has changed. Look at the slant. Look at the cant of the eye and look at how it straightened up. That is what neuromuscular dentistry helps. I will show you a case of neuromuscular orthodontics as well. So, this is how a patient turned up to me. Actually, he had already done orthodontics. So, it was pretty weird. Anyway, we recorded the bite. We gave him a Mora, which is a mandible occlusal repositioning appliance on the upper palate. And uh, we wired him. We gave him those box elastics. We closed the spaces. And there you go. That is the finished bite. This is how he turned up. And this is how he is. And no more headaches. Uh, we have another TMD patient here. The same symptoms, the same problems. We do the entire tensing, the K7 and we record the bite. Once the bite is registered, we give him an orthotic. He wears the orthotic for at least uh, 6 months. He comes back after 6 months in no pain at all. Time to go to the next step. He wanted, he preferred uh, I suggested orthodontics because he is a young patient, but he was in a hurry. So, we had to provide him with uh, crowns. So, we checked his muscles, we did the EMG readings, we took his new bite. So, we prepared his lower teeth. This is his bite. So, this is the bite articulation. You can see how the vertical has opened up. This is the crowns and this is how it is when the crowns were placed in the mouth. The anterior spacing was closed with the help of orthodontics. Before I go forward, I would like to share uh, my gratitude uh, to my professors who have led the way for me, who have shown me how to work, how to help our patients. Uh, I feel I would not be anywhere if I had not thanked them enough. 
uh, Dr. Fabio, Dr. Piero, uh, I have Dr. Jameson, Dr. Nosher, uh, and last but not the least, Dr. Norm Thomas. Uh, he's the one who asked, who forced me to do the mastership. Uh, I was one of the few guys who did the fellowship and the mastership at the same try and I got through which was amazing actually and if it, not, if it were not for him, I would not be where I am. So, let's talk about obstructive sleep apnea. What is OSA? OSA is basically a disorder where the lower jaw drops back the tongue falls back causing an obstruction during sleep resulting in an apnea. What's an apnea? An apnea is an event during your breathing where you don't breathe at all. What causes that apnea? As this figure shows, you can see the lack of airway space. There's no patency. So this is when the patient is awake and standing up. Think what happens when the patient lies down. The whole jaw drops back. When the jaw drops back, the tongue falls back. When the tongue falls back, the airway is blocked. Not enough oxygen, not enough ventilation within the human body. It's a big problem. So the genial glossus muscle is attached to the genial tubercles of the mandible. 40% of all deaths during sleep are MI related. Okay, myocardial infarction. 80% of all sleep deaths are due to untreated and undiagnosed sleep apnea. So, how do we diagnose it? We use the stop bank questionnaire like I had mentioned before. We do a sleep study. It could be a home study or it could be the polysomnography that you do it at the hospital. The stop bank. S is the snoring. So, do you snore? Most of them say, no, maybe a little. Doesn't matter. The sleep study would show you exactly how much you snore. Are you tired during the daytime? Most of them are. They wake up at night because they have a disturbed sleep. Their oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration is varying, which actually tells the brain to ask the patient to break the sleep so that the, the oxygen saturation increases. Blood pressure, a varying blood pressure, that's a problem. Physical exertional dyspnea, what happens? The heart is getting tired because it's not getting enough oxygen. So the minute you start climbing stairs, you feel breathless faster than your friends. BMI, a higher BMI would lead to a possibility of sleep apnea. Age, the higher age, possibility of sleep apnea increases. Neck circumference, the wider your neck is, the more fat there is. So when you go to sleep, the airway is compressed again. Gender, yeah, men are more likely to end up with sleep apnea than women, uh, although that's a figure that I wouldn't be sure of. So, sleep study. So, we need to confirm whether the patient has sleep apnea or not. How do we confirm? You could either do that, the polysomnograph, or just a simple watch pad machine. A polysomnograph is, I use the polysomnograph for my uh, research purposes. Uh, it's tough for a person to get in, to sleep on a different bed. And more than that, to have all those electrodes on your body. So, that gives you the parameters that are more than enough. Now, what exactly is sleep apnea? People with a faulty positioning of the lower jaw, they end up with the jaw placed more often than not backward. Okay? Let's forget the downward and the upward part. I mean the inward and the upward part. When the, when the jaw is already placed backwards and the patient goes to sleep, the muscles relax and the jaw falls even more backward. And the tongue that is attached to the lower jaw drops down. As it drops down, the airway is blocked at the nasopharynx area. Oxygen doesn't get in. The heart doesn't function enough. And there is an accumulation of carbon dioxide within the body because even the carbon dioxide isn't being thrown out. So at one point of time, the oxygen desaturation comes down below 97%, which is dangerous. We need to be very careful. If we do not break that cycle, you, you know, you might be dead there, then and there, next moment. Which is why our body 
has an autonomic response system. The brain tells your tongue, go forward. As the tongue goes forward, it pulls the lower jaw along with it and you end up with a clench. There are numerous studies nowadays that shows the relationship between a clench and a desaturation event. So for every desaturation event, you have a clench. So what do we do? We do the sleep study. What does the sleep study show? You can see the AHI, which is the apnea hypopnea index. An apnea is an, is an event where you don't breathe at all. A hypopnea is an event where you have a half breath. Okay. So let's take a closer look on that. Yep. So the AHI is 21 as an example and the AHI is 23. I mean the RI is 23, which is the rep respiratory index. They should ideally be below 5. Okay. What it actually means is there has been uh, an event of, uh, I mean, not exactly an event. The number of times you've not taken a breath or a half breath every hour. Okay. So this patient has gone to 21 times every hour. Wow, that's huge. Now, but the thing that really disturbs me is the number of desaturations, 89. So that means 89 times that patient has, you know, clenched. Because as a dentist, that hurts the TMJ. So most of my patients who have TMJ have sleep apnea. Not all sleep apnea patients have TMJ though. Maybe because the muscles are a little more resilient. Maybe because the disc is a little more resilient. But TMJ patients, sleep apnea, yes, majority of them. So what is the treatment? All along, it's been the CPAP. The CPAP works absolutely fine, provided your AHI is above 15. So what do you do for patients with below 15? You have your oral appliances, and that's where we come into the fore. What if your AHI is above 60? Wow, you need both. You need CPAP and the oral appliance. So we'll show you examples. Yes, and surgical procedures, very important. So every sleep apnea patient that comes to me i make sure that they undergo an ent consult as well because we need to make sure that it's not just the tongue that's the obstruction there could be uh, nasal polyps there could be a deviated nasal septum there could be adenoids there could be tonsils we need to make sure the whole nasal airway is cleared so this is the cpap people wear it so what the CPAP does is, it pushes air into the airway, which then pushes the tongue forward. So what does the oral appliance do? When you wear the appliance, the jaw is pulled forward and hence the tongue is pushed forward and the tongue doesn't fall back. So there are a lot of devices. They are the tongue retaining devices. We have fixed appliances. We have adjustable appliances. These are the more commonly used because we can help with the titration of the device, you can change the position. And these are the devices wherein you need both the appliance and the CPAP. Wear the appliance, have a sound sleep, keep your spouse happy. Yes. And your fellow passengers as well. Yes. So next, we are off to the highly complex problem of cranio-cervical mandibular disorder. So what's that? We need to understand that we are not just looking at the face, okay? I started out as a dentist. I ended up with facial pain, headaches. Then I started looking after sleep apnea and possible cardiac problems. And now I'm also looking after cervical issues. The body posture, body pain, leg aches, restless leg syndromes. No, just mention it, it's all there. So the cervical is a very important part of TMJ treatment. Why? With every change in position of your lower jaw, there is a change in position of your cervical vertebrae. As an example, when you stand erect and you bite your teeth, turn your head, bite your teeth, turn it this way, you'll notice that different teeth contact at different neck positions. Why? Simple. For the reason that I stated earlier, every change in jaw position, there's a change in cervical vertebrae position. So what are the vertebrae that we're looking at? So the occiput sits on the atlas and the atlas is on the 
axis. So you have the atlanto occipital joint and the atlanto axial joint. These are very important. The whole system works like a hinge. So the axis point which acts as a pivot on the mandibular movement. And you can see how that pivot is in the same line as the occlusion, which is why it, it plays an important role in your posture. So you can see cervical movements alter the mandibular position, just like how I said. So when you stretch your neck backwards, you can see how your jaw goes backward. Stretch it forward, you can see how your jaw comes forward. The most commonly followed protocol in treating cervical posturology by us dentists would be Rocobardo. Mariano Rocobardo is a very famous uh, doctor who takes care of uh, the neck and uh, the next step in uh, TMJ treatment is to do one of his courses and make sure that you are very good at that. Our course 7 takes care of cervical posturology. Ideally, we would like to send our patients to a Nuka chiropractor because how much can you do, right? You have got your limitations, you are a dentist, you have got other patients coming in. Do you want to look after this as well? I would not opt to, but provided you have a good chiropractor, you have a good Nuka chiropractor. Now, what is a Nuka chiropractor? Nuka chiropractors are those who take care of just the upper cervical. What if there is a, there is a scoliosis? You know, there is a kyphosis. None of this can be taken care of us by us. We need their help. So, ideally, in a dental setup, if you're taking, if you're doing TMJ treatment, you'd like to work with a chiropractor. There is physical therapy, muscle tonicity exercises, hip rotations, pedometry, podiatry. So, what started with general dentistry went on to occlusion went on to posturology, sleep apnea, and now general well-being. This is the fact that I keep going around and pressing upon. Do not consider yourself as just a tooth doctor. Stop being so mechanical. Come on. Think. Broaden the horizon. You know, you... Why do we always have to be stuck with the teeth? Our teeth control more than just the bite more than just chewing food, more than just a smile. There's a whole lot of other things that are behind it. Once again, I'd like to stress the fact that ICMO India is going big and you might be listening to this because you've joined for our course too and I'll make sure I see all of you there.